got our thundering curve going down the stairs now. So thank you for that. I love them. Every single one of them. Christian's giving me a thumbs up, so I think we're good. All right, we're good to go. Oh, man. Uh, this morning, I want to open up uh, just with a quick question. Uh, what are some of your favorite stories? Uh, maybe, maybe some of you guys really appreciate uh, just the Lord of the Rings. Maybe that some of you guys have heard of that. Maybe the Avengers is a pretty popular nowadays. Maybe you appreciate Star Wars or The Wizard of Oz or Harry Potter or Aladdin, Lion King. Uh, if I were to ask you, what do all of those stories have in common? You probably could think about it for a second, but it'd take you maybe a, a quick second. But really, it's the conflict between good and evil, right? It's the conflict between these characters that we like to root for, and then you got these just evil, conniving people on one side. And part of the reason I think we celebrate these stories so much is that neither side really ever seems to have a clear advantage, right? Often the heroes suffer some sort of loss. Uh, I won't spoil the endgame if you haven't seen it yet, but just all throughout the, the Avengers movies, you know, they have their own losses and their battles. In the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring, they lose some of their dearest friends. The Rebellion loses some incredible people along their fight against the Empire. And Dorothy experiences defeat when she's captured by the Wicked Witch. And her cute flying monkey thingies. <laughs> I don't really know what they're called, but I mean, they're kind of cute, I guess. But Harry Potter, I mean, even in his own, his own battles, he loses his own family members even, and some of his closest friends in battle. We often find ourselves rooting for the good guys, right? We like, to, we like it when the good guys win. But I'll be honest, there are times in my life where I've genuinely empathized with the bad guy in some of these, these stories. As demented as his thinking is, uh, Thanos has some good points in the Avengers movies. Gollum, you've probably heard of him, this really weird-looking creature. He's not entirely evil. He just does evil things at times. Darth Vader is a very broken character, and while we see redemption at the end of his life, he's still one bad dude, <laughs> right? We don't know a whole lot about the Wicked Witch, but we just know that we're told to assume that she's evil. Voldemort doesn't have any redeeming qualities until he realizes he grew up in an abusive home where all he knew was hatred. And I can sympathize with bad guys, and I almost root for them. Now again, I still cheer when the good guys win, but there's an idealistic, non-corruptible side of me that wants to see all this, these battles done in a different way when there's actually some sort of <coughs> democracy, you know, some, more, some kind of diplomacy almost. I wish they could have just talked it out and reconciled the differences. And I fully believe that my ability to have compassion and mercy for unlovable characters is a God-given gift. And there was even one time growing up where I found myself in Sunday school class uh, in a conversation with my Sunday school teacher uh, that God should just forgive the devil. And so this was an interesting conversation, as you can imagine. As a pastor's kid, it kind of put my dad in a tough spot. Uh, I can't imagine that conversation of, you know, pastor, your son was uh, interrupting the class talking about how God should just forgive the devil and, you know, we should work through this. I don't know what that looked like. But I know my conversation with my dad following that you know, we, we talked through, and I had to come to the realization and conclusion that, you know, the devil has no redemption. There's nothing to be redeemed about him. His fate is sealed. And in that way, we are different than the devil in that we actually can change. We're given, we're given grace, whereas the devil has none. And so while I'm thankful for that understanding, I understand that we're on the winning side. There's still a very small part of me that wants to see the to, to see the brokenness redeemed in the world around me. And so what does all this have to do with today, and with this message? And so as we collected the questions again over the past few months, uh, we were given the initial question of, should we be seeing more gifts of the Holy Spirit today in church? And why do we not? And also, how do we know that something is truly a gift of the Spirit? And so the truth is, in all these circumstances, all these stories I just shared about, all these heroes have different personalities, they have different gifts, different abilities that really, on their own, do not stand a chance against the forces of darkness, right? We see that. They're not in it alone. And yet, they, they conquer evil, you know, they beat bad guys. And in our own life, we all are given some form of a spiritual gift. Whether we recognize that or not, we are all gifted in some unique way. So the truth is, I'm not going to be able to fully convey the power of every single gift today. But I do want to offer a general consensus, more or less, of what we recognize as spiritual gifts and how to discern what each of our gifts are. And so to preface this message today, I'm going to be sharing Romans 12, 4 through 6. It'll be on the screen if you want to follow along with me. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members 
members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Would you just join me in prayer just for a moment? Uh, Father God, I want to thank you so very much uh, just for a beautiful service already. Lord, as we unpack your word, would you just teach us now in these next few moments? Lord, would you remind us of our worth in you and that you would remind us of what you are giving to us, every single one of us, through your grace. Lord, we love you. Be with us now in these next few moments. In your name, amen. So again, as believers, would we all agree we are called to have a purpose? We're all called to embrace a purpose and to allow the Spirit to guide us. Would we, would we agree with that? Say amen if you agree. Amen. amen. Okay, so before we go on, I have to say something. We don't have to be afraid of the Spirit. Oftentimes, we talk about spiritual gifts, and some of us get a little bit tense, we get a little bit nervous. Just relax. <laughs> Today is not going to be a day where we're going to be pulling out snakes or anything. We're going to be cutting ourselves in the middle of service. It's not going to be that kind of service. This will never be that kind of church. But we do have to talk about the Holy Spirit because so often we leave this is such an integral part of the Trinity. I mean, you really can't have a Trinity without the Holy Spirit. We leave Him out so often in our lives, and we just try to exist in life just with the love of God, the Father, and Jesus Christ. But again, the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' own word, says that He's even greater than what He was going able to do in His life in our hearts. And so the Holy Spirit is here to help you, and He's here to help me open our eyes to everything God wants us to experience and to share with the world. And so again, when we talk about spiritual gifts, I'm not talking about gaining some superpowers. You're not going to get radioactive spiders to bite you all at the end of service. Nothing like that. We're talking about the part of the Trinity that makes his home in your heart and in mine. And so I'll say this right up front. The ultimate gift of the Spirit is the Spirit himself. If, for those of you who take notes, that's the first point right there. It's the ultimate gift of the Spirit is the Spirit himself. And so as Jerry was even just talking about a few moments ago, the fact that God loves us enough to create us is one thing, right? We all understand that God loves us, He made us, even though you were flawed and broken, He created us. Yet then, even more so, the fact that He came and died for every one of us, that's just crazy, right? But then you even pile on top of this crazy love that God has for us, that He would actually be willing to make His home in each of our own hearts. That's baffling. <laughs> Again, I think we've talked about how in comparison to God, we're almost like ants. If you can imagine being able to put your essence of everything of who you are, your character, all these things that make you, you, and yet you were to put that inside of an ant. Can you just imagine that for a moment? That's crazy. And so you're going to hear a lot from Kylie over the next few weeks of the excitement of Pentecost. Again, the, the day where we recognize and celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit descending upon all the disciples who were gathered together after Christ's resurrection. And so the Holy Spirit came and entered the disciples and awakened their supernatural, God-given gifts. And these gifts the disciples had was not for their own benefit, right? It was for the benefit of those who would believe in Christ through the use of those gifts. If I can be completely transparent with you today, I want each of you to realize that we all have a spiritual gift, and we are all uniquely uh, built in a way that we can actually be a transforming presence where people learn to live, grow, and serve like Christ. But in order for that to happen, it's going to take all of us. It's going to take every single one of us. And so all disclaimers, all side, all hearts open and ready, we're going to keep moving on through this. Okay, so spiritual giftedness is the way in which God can use us for the work of the church. In other words, the Worldwide Capital C Church will never, ever fully realize its potential unless every individual believer wakes up and embraces his or her own giftings. And so I hope that you'll see your spiritual gifts are lived out more and more here at LWC. Some of you may have the same gifts, and that's okay. There are going to be some of you who may be the only person here present who has that spiritual gift. The bottom line is that we need each other. And when we all embrace our personal gifts, we'll begin to realize more and more of God's beautiful plan to redeem and reconcile our world and our community around us. And so this, the question still remains, though, what are spiritual gifts? While some denominations of churches don't recognize the same gifts, we want to be completely true to Scripture and not pick and choose the gifts that we're going to talk about. And so 
Uh, right off the bat, I'm going to share this quote with you. I thought it was really powerful. It's James Dunn, a very good a theologian and writer, talked about spiritual gifts this way. He said, spiritual gifts are an inner work of grace that are being brought forward for our expression. I'll say that again. Spiritual gifts are an inner work of grace that are being brought forward for our expression. That's another fancy way of just saying, essentially, the grace that we have in each of our own lives and the grace that we're experiencing, all the lens that we're seeing that through all of our life circumstances, all of our life experiences, is being filtered through God's grace. And so these gifts that we have are then coming forward as a way to show the world and those around us the same kind of grace that we've received. Does that make sense? Obviously, just because we talk about spiritual gifts does not mean every gift will be represented here in our church today. But we do still need to cover them because we believe spiritual gifts can be developed and discovered. They're not unchanging and static, right? But as the ebb and flow of time affects us in the same way, spiritual gifts are dynamic and can change over time or can be honed in a way almost that you could be better at utilizing your spiritual gift. And so there are three main categories of spiritual gifts I want to share with you today. And the first one is practical gifts. The second is positional gifts. And the third is power gifts. Now again, I know those all sound kind of different and it might be a little bit confusing. And I meant to, to share with you each of the different gifts, but more than enough space there in another section. So uh, I'm not going to read each of those scripture passages that you have in your bulletin. I, I would encourage you to read on your own time. But Romans 12, 6 through 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 27 to 31, those really cover what we would call the practical gifts. These are gifts like teaching, serving, evan- or, excuse me, encouragement, giving, help, compassion, faith, discernment, administration. These are all gifts that really help move along the business of church. And so uh, we'll, we'll talk through that in a little bit. Positional gifts, what we would consider a, a almost vocational ministry is apostleship, prophecy, evangelism, shepherding, and pastoring, in other words. These are kind of the gifts that you'd see pastors operate in. And the power gifts are tongues, interpretation, healing, miracles, wisdom, and knowledge. These are all gifts that are a supernatural embodiment of God working in your life for other people to see and witness. And so faith all this is based on the premise of faith and the grace that God gives us. And so faith is unconditional, creaturely trust alone. And why do I say creaturely? In other words, God is creator, we are not. He is God, and we are not. He is strong, and we are weak. God is perfect, we are imperfect. God never changes, and yet we change all the time. And so these gifts are based on our faith and our ability to receive this grace and allow God to use us as his instrument. So as we continue on in our lives, even from the moment we get saved, from the moment we die, we're constantly allowing God to use us as his instrument, as a vessel of sorts for God and to use his grace to the world. And even though we see words like practical, positional, and power, that last one kind of sticks with you. You might think that power represents this, this hierarchy almost, of what it means to have a spiritual gift. But I'm going to tell you, there's not a gift that is greater than any other gift. I've heard from close friends that grew up in Pentecostal churches, they grew up exalting the gift of tongues. Yet they didn't even know or hardly even recognize any other gifts. Some people even took it as far as to say that if you did not speak in tongues, you did not have the Holy Spirit in your life. And that's simply not true. In other words, you were a second rate, almost a, a lower class Christian, if you did not speak in tongues. That's a terrible way to live your faith be told that you don't have the Holy Spirit, and that's simply not true again. Ephesians 4, 14 through 16 says it this way, when we embody these spiritual gifts, he says, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. As the body of Christ, there is not just one part of the body that's more essential than another. I think too many churches have adopted a top-down leadership system where there are certain gifts for certain people, like the pastors who are exalted and, and put on this pedestal and say, oh, you know, you're the greatest in all the world. That's not biblical. That's not true. I'm here to tell you that the body of Christ is intended to be an egalitarian environment. In other words, everyone is equal. Everyone is important. 
Some of you skeptics in the room might still be asking, isn't it just another fancy way of saying, isn't no one important? And I would challenge you on that by sticking with the metaphor of the human body. Uh, if you can imagine, just for a moment, you've got your own, your little baby toe. Hopefully all of us have our baby toes here. I don't know, maybe some of us don't. But if you were to magically just lose your baby toe, do you realize you could not walk? You'd have no way of balancing yourself. You would fall over. The second, the second you took a step, you'd fall over. In the same way, every spiritual gift that we have, that, that is described in Scripture, has a purpose and has a role in the grand scheme of the big C, capital C, church. And so as much fun as it would be to see Kai and me running around trying to do everything on a weekly basis, we literally cannot do the ministry of the church by ourselves. We need you. And even in our own church, we see this time and time again. Miss Jo arguably has one of the best manifestations of the spiritual gift of service that I can think of. She's consistent, she's humble, she's always willing to serve. And I think of little ones like Christian, and I see him and his optimism, but mostly his faith. He's always willing to share his faith. He's always willing to encourage you. That's just who he is. He's going to be able to lend his faith to anyone who asks. He always has a smile. He's always uh, offering a warm reminder of having faith, right? And we have other people like Martha, Everett, and Cynthia, and Andre. These are people that have developed the gift of teaching and are using their gift to equip others with biblical understanding. There are others of us like Miss Lynn and Brandon who clearly have the gifts of help and are able, always available to and ready to help whenever they can. Over the past couple of years, we've had events and special food drives, and many of you on many occasions have given above and beyond the calling of what we would consider just to give the time, right? You've gone above and beyond. That's what we call generosity, the spiritual gift of generosity lived out. I have hundreds of small, maybe seemingly small and significant cases where you guys have offered me grace and compassion, or highly grace and compassion, even where you have no reason to, right? That's compassion and mercy being lived out. You've offered wisdom and knowledge to others when asked. I can look over every single one of your faces and tell you and see how there are spiritual gifts being embodied more and more through your actions. The power gifts, though, again, as I mentioned, they're just as real and as tangible as the rest of the gifts. I know many of us prayed for the healing of some dear friends over the past several months. And while we may not have seen that come to fruition, we also know that we've been granted a lot of extra time with a lot of these people. We saw the grace of God providing several additional years, even, to some of the lives of our brothers and sisters in this local church family. Even this week, uh, I've seen a miracle happen in the life of Aaron Winters. I don't know if you guys might remember Pastor Andre, but his wife, uh, in this past week, had some very, uh, very serious uh, medical complications, excuse me, um, where she was losing a lot of blood. And so she was going into the hospital, and they, the doctors were honestly not very optimistic about her recovering, at least not fully. And yet, somehow, through the grace of God and the people praying diligently over her, we've seen a miracle take place where she's now in a general hospital and she's no longer in the ICU, and she's going to be coming home most likely at some point this week. That's God moving in a real and tangible way in church today. Some of you may be very confident in your spiritual gifts. While there's still some of you, some of you may be a little uncertain what your spiritual gift is, and that's okay. I need to say that up front. It's okay to not be okay. Not to be sure what your gift is. The final piece of today, the final question we're answering is how to discern our spiritual gifts. And I know, again, we're not going to be able to fully cover this just on a Sunday morning. If you, again, we welcome any conversation over this, Kyle and I do. But the truth is that spiritual gifts are formed within the depths of our souls. As I already said before, that quote from James Dunn, spiritual gifts are an inner work of grace that are being brought forward for outer expression. So some of you have natural talents and abilities. And some of your spiritual gifts are enhanced even more by those talents and abilities. If you have a naturally organized mind and you're looking to make things more efficient, you probably have the spiritual gift of administration. If you ever found yourself in a, in a situation where people are looking to you to make a decision, you might have the spiritual gift of discernment. If you're a naturally charismatic, influential person, you probably have the spiritual gift of leadership. If you find yourself addressing good things or bad things in others and feel compelled to call them out, that's probably the prophecy of, of calling forth things out from people. If you find it easy and natural to lead conversations in a spiritual direction, you more than likely have a spiritual gift of evangelism. If you find it easy to study and to translate different languages, you probably have the gift of tongues or interpretation. If you have the ability to be patient and compassionate with people consistently over long periods of time, 
you likely have the gift of shepherding or pastoring. My sister discovered she had the gift of tongues uh, while she and her husband were serving as missionaries in Brazil. Um, they'd studied Portuguese all throughout leading up to their time in Brazil, but she really didn't find it easy, and she found it really, really difficult to, you know, to go in there. And so she felt very nervous in, in the coming weeks before their, their sending out. But within a week of her time, she found herself somehow able to really hold conversations in a supernatural way where she really had no business understanding, yet she could maintain fluent conversations with them. Again, I believe that is God working through her in a spiritual gift of tongues. My aunt and uncle have been missionaries in Zambia for nearly 30 years now. My uncle would attest and he would confess, really, that he has not learned local languages or dialects. Yet my aunt has never technically studied them, and yet she's been able to interpret over a wide array of African dialects and inflections. That's interpretation being lived out. And so tongues interpretation, I have to just go on a quick tangent for a second. They often are seen as these almost uh, voodoo or bad juju, really, more or less, in church. And that's, that's not the case. They're not intended for chaos. They're not intended to be spectacles in worship services. It's intended for intelligible languages. However, I will still affirm that there is a difference in a static speech or what we might hear as prayer language or charismata. I've been to the Pentecostal church and I can test and affirm that the Holy Spirit has moved in a mighty way through that when it's been biblically done with interpretation. And some people only use that speech in their personal prayer and devotions. And the Wesleyan Church affirms that this is a biblical intention for speaking in that way. Another part of discerning our spiritual gifts, though, is that whether it proves to be beneficial to the church. Spiritual gifts, again, are not primarily intended to make you or make me feel better about ourselves, right? They're intended to edify and to build up the church. And so our spiritual gifts are for that purpose. As Paul writes in Romans 12 and Ephesians 4, as I shared with you earlier, these gifts are given in accordance with the grace that God has given each and every one of us. And so some of us, <laughs> some of us may need more grace than others, right? We can admit that. I'm just kidding. But we have all been given grace, and for, I, for one, want to immerse myself more and more in the grace that God has given me, according to His measure. And so if you hear nothing else today, Please hear that God's grace is sufficient and He wants to transform your life and the life of others through you. We are blessed to be a blessing. We are given gifts to be a gift. If you're extra curious about your spiritual gifts and want to dive deeper into your own spiritual gifts, I would highly recommend the book Discovering Your Spiritual Gifts by Kenneth Kane Kinghorn. Again, Kinghorn is the last name there, but just Discovering Your Spiritual Gifts. It's three dollars on most digital platforms. I think it's less than $10 for a physical copy in Barnes & Noble. Uh, but we have the assessment tracker if you ever want to do that and you like to discover your, your spiritual gifts. If you're interested in that, talk with us after the service, okay? And all the gifts I've covered today, though, and all the examples I've tried to, to shed some light on, the bottom line is that the greatest spiritual gift of all is always going to be the Spirit Himself. We can develop and hone our gifts to be more effective in the ways that we lead our lives, but in the end, the Spirit's presence in our lives is what is the best news of all. You've probably heard that practice makes perfect, right? We might have heard that before. I would challenge that a little bit and say that practice does not make perfect. It makes progress. And as long as we are open and receptive to God's grace at work in our lives, the Spirit will change us from the inside out. And so my desire and my prayer today is that we would all be open to discovering more and more of God's grace in our own lives. We can turn, in turn offer grace to the broken world around us that is in desperate need of such grace. As I wrap up, I, I just want to share again, um, this conversation is not meant to be a uh, confusing time, and I hope that you don't approach spiritual gifts with this, this taboo thing. It's something that real that is real and that is needed so much more in our world. Again, I, I think even more just this past week of the shooting there at UNC Charlotte. And even all over the world, we've seen all sorts of just disasters and storms that are threatening to destroy people, destroy land and property. Our world needs more of God's grace being lived out. And part of that is absolutely going to just be given by God alone. But the world also needs you. He needs me. He needs us to step up and to look ourselves in the mirror and say, you know what? I am capable. I've been given grace. I can give grace. 
And so the calling again is still for today that we would just be open. And so my prayer, again, is that we would just be open to see this grace lived out in our spiritual gifts. As you may be continuing to think about your own spiritual gifts and what that looks like for you to live that out on a daily basis, I'm going to be praying for you and be praying for me as well that I continue to grow in my own gifts and we would all see ourselves as a part of the body, not just a little church here in Lyman, but again, as a part of the big scheme, the global church, to see God's kingdom built around the world. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, we thank you so much um, that you love us enough to give us grace, first of all. Lord, we also thank you that your grace is lived out in our lives in some incredible ways. God, as we go about our weeks, would you just be with us? Would you remind us of your presence? We would be reminded that we're not alone, that we have you as a constant companion, a consistent help. Lord, some of us in this room are, are struggling with just faith in general right now, Lord. It's a tough season. A lot of us are experiencing that. Lord, would you just give us an extra helping, if you will, of faith? Lord, help us to see that you are at work even when we don't see you at work. Lord, for those of us that are curious and want to continue to grow in our spiritual gifts, Lord, you just give us wisdom and, and tools and resources to grow that, to discover that. God, we want to look more like you. At the end of the day, Lord, that's what matters. It doesn't matter what we make. It doesn't matter what our life looks like. It doesn't matter if our picture-perfect family isn't as picture-perfect as we think. Lord, we just want to be like you. And so, Lord, our prayer as we go is that you would transform us from the inside out, that we would give grace where grace is needed, and that we would receive your grace and be sure to know that we are loved by you because you have called us your children. Lord, we love you and thank you and praise you for all of your blessings and all that you do for us. Lord, just be with us now as we go. We ask this all in your name. Amen.